the reason I was just singing Bare Naked Ladies is because my car does this weird thing where if you're if you if you plug in the eye when you cross the Canadian border, it just blares it. At you. <laughs> it just yeah. blares bare naked. Uh, it depends on what part of Canada you're driving into. If you're closer to the West Coast, mm-hmm. it'll play Mother Mother. If you're in Ontario, you might get Neil Young. You might get Bare Naked Ladies. It's mm-hmm. it's a crapshoot. Mm-hmm. But so what happens is if you're not like in the middle of a song on your iPhone or whatever whatever music device you're using, and then you plug it into the car. Mm-hmm. It'll play the first song in the queue, and the first song alphabetically is A by Bare Naked Ladies, because <laughs> they have a song. Because of course they have a song called A. Mm-hmm. So I've heard, the <laughs> and it's the letter A. It's not E. It's right. <laughs> it's <like> e. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Spoiler Peace Theater, the podcast that doesn't give a shit about spoilers. We just want to talk about the movies. My name is Dave Riedel. I write for Salt Lake City Weekly, Orlando Weekly, some other paper that I can't remember the name of right now, and I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. Fun fact, that's actually the name of the paper. <laughs> uh, my name is Chris Jensen. I'm a contributing writer at Civo Weekly, and I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. I feel like the response to that was, talk about a masthead. hey <laughs> Um My name is Evan Crean. I am, uh, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm editor over at The Independent. I don't think I ever mentioned that. Uh, I'm, edi- I'm editing over there now. Uh, I am co-chair of, of Bavka and uh, co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. Yeah. If there's one thing we've made clear here is uh, the fluidity of the state of... Uh of movie journalism yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah it's it, definitely yeah. <laughs> so uh on this show uh we got uh some stuff uh in case you were living under a rock this actually made national news which i didn't know uh there was a keanu thon which is to say a lot of keanu reeves movies shown last weekend at the coolidge corner theater in brookline massachusetts and the reason i know it made national news is because there were a couple four five six people in the audience from Literally different. Somebody was there from Seattle, a couple people from L.A., somebody from Denver. And I'm like, what the fuck? And so then I Googled it. Mm-hmm. And other it, the, the story that ran in the globe got picked up and was in these other places. And so people fucking came to Boston to watch six Keanu Reeves movies <laughs> from midnight to noon last week. So that's we're going to talk about that. We've also got the new Spider-Man Far From Home. Mm-hmm. Which uh, comes out uh, July? Fo- Did it come out by the it's time? It's out. It's out. Yes. All oh, right. We're recording this on a Wednesday. You'll hear this Friday morning. It's out. You may have seen it already. In which case, go ahead and listen, uh, <laughs> because we will be spoiling it. But first, because I am actually in the studio tonight, <laughs> and because <laughs> because I saw an unusually large number of movies last week for me in the in the month of June. 30 days in June. I saw 28 movies in June. So I haven't watched that many movies in one month. Now, granted, six of them were in one night. But I haven't watched that many movies in a month in a very long time. So I wanted to talk very briefly about all this shit that I watched. And when I say shit, I mean shit. On uh, Netflix and Prime. Uh, The first movie, it's on Netflix. It's been out for a couple years. It's called Mm -hmm. The Babysitter. And part of the reason I watched it is because, one, it was short. It's 87 minutes long, which is when you're watching a Netflix movie that you're pretty sure you've never heard of and probably won't be very good, but it's directed by somebody famous, in this case, McGee, you're like, it's 87 minutes. That's long enough for a nap for a baby. Wait, Mm -hmm. is this not the Alicia Silverstone? No. Oh, I looked at the list and I thought that that's what you're talking about. No, this is uh, Samara Weaving, who I guess is Hugo Weaving's niece Mm. and Mm -hmm. uh, some other people that I've actually know. The guy in it is um, the boy, the guy who ends up being the boyfriend in the duff. He's uh. he's he's in it too, and then there's a dork in it. But this is about uh, a kid who's 12 years old and too too old to have his baby a babysitter, and his parents Ken Marino and Leslie Bibb, both of whom I love. I love Ken Marino. I love Leslie Bibb. They're his parents. They have all the funniest lines in the movie. Unfortunately, they're only in the movie for like eight minutes. Yes, because they go off to you know have some sex at a hotel for the weekend, and mm-hmm. Samara Weaving, the hot babysitter, who's very cool and loves this kid, you know. Her name is B, as in B E E, mm-hmm. and um, his name is Cole, and she calls him C. Um, and they like do the E T finger thing when they like part ways and stuff, and they have dance parties, and 
you know, and she just, she likes him a little too much as like, you know, cause everybody had a cool babysitter, but you know, because this movie's called the babysitter mm-hmm. that there's some kind of ulterior motive. And it is that they invite some, she and her friends invite some dork over to the kid's house. She gives him a sleeping aid to make the kid fall asleep. Um, but he doesn't drink it. He's talking to his friend across the street and is like, well, what do you think she like does when, you know, I go to bed and she's like, eh, she, the friend's like, eh, she probably has her boyfriend over and they probably have sex all night. He's mm-hmm. like, no, I don't, I don't think that's it. I don't think she's got a boyfriend right now. He's like, and sh- his friend is like, all right, whatever. So he doesn't drink the sleeping thing. And then he fakes going to sleep. He watches them through the banister. They're down in the living room and they've invited over this total dork and they're playing spin the bottle mm-hmm. and you know, the bottle lands on the dork and the babysitter kisses the dork, and then she stabs him in the head twice with these two enormous fucking knives. And then two other guys grab some goblets and let uh, like grab all. And this is a comedy, by the way. All mm-hmm. the let all the blood drain into the goblets, except one shoots one guy in the face. He's like, "I got blood in my mouth. I hope this guy didn't have AIDS." And you're like, "Um, well, no, because he's the school dork." But also, we're making this joke, <laughs> okay? Yeah, mm-hmm. um, real. Edgy stuff, McG. Nice I think going. this is somewhere. This is around the point I tuned out of the movie. Yeah, I, I tried to watch it one time and I can make it through. Well, it turns out that you know she. You don't know how old she is, but you get the idea that she's been doing this for quite a while. She has sold her soul to Satan to get what she wants out of life, which is apparently to be a hot babysitter. I, I don't know. That's one of the things that doesn't really make sense. But all the other teenagers who are there, one of whom is, uh, like I said, the kid from the Duff. And then there's, uh, what's her name? Bella Thorne mm. is in it. Um, she gets, <laughs> actually her death is kind of funny in a dis- totally disgusting kind of way. And then there's another woman there and she gets blown up by a bottle rocket. But um, anyway, uh, they they go to get the kid's blood because they need the blood of the innocent. And they don't kill mm. him. They just, you know, take some of his blood Name with a him. syringe. No, they just, they, they go up, they think that he's been given a sleeping agent and he just pretends to be asleep. And they just like stick a needle in his arm and withdraw the blood. And because you have to mix the blood of this dork and then the other dork, and then you drop the blood in this book, and then Satan will give you what you want. And dork Satan. Yeah. And is, <laughs> is now is a cult real? Is the occult stuff real or is it there? Is it imagined by by the main character? Yeah. Like the kid or, or the babysitter? I like, mean, like, does is this does Satan really exist here or does whatever? The, does the magic actually work? Well, Yes, they don't actually get to the magic in this movie, but it is implied, especially with the way the movie ends, that she is supernatural somehow because of the deal that she has made with Satan, you know, Uh, because she gets run over by a car and is like basically cut in half uh, at the end of the movie. (laughs) And then the parents come home. They're like, why didn't you call us? He's like, because I don't need a babysitter. And then, like, the fire department and the EMT guys are, like, looking through the rope because he drives the car through the window of his own house. He, mm-hmm. like, he like sets the book on fire, puts it in front of this picture window. She's trying to put it out, and he steals a car from across the street and drives it through the window and crushes her. And she's like, wow, I actually didn't see that coming. You did really well because she also, in the beginning of the movie, tells him how to, like, stand up to bullies and stuff, and he mm-hmm. uses that against her. And then the EMTs and the cops and everybody are going through the house like looking for survivors and she's not under the car anymore and she comes from out of nowhere and like stabs a firefighter in the neck and that's the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she was cut in two or, you know, basically flattened five minutes ago and now she's standing up rushing a guy. Mm -hmm. So I think that the magic worked for her, whatever it is. Um, Interesting. Uh, a lot of people die by a horrible, gruesome neck violence in this movie. One guy accidentally hangs himself because uh, a bully is egging the kid's house, mm-hmm. and he gets egg on him while the high school jock is chasing him, trying to kill him. And the high school jock has a rope because uh, the kid has a treehouse, and he uses the treehouse to climb the rope. Mm-hmm. And then you know he accidentally kicks the rope down, and the jock climbs up, and he's trying to wipe the egg off, and he doesn't, and he gets the rope around his neck somehow and falls off because he's trying to grab a limb and. You see his like spine come out the back of his neck. It's really disgusting. And then another guy like gets stabbed through the neck with like a, a ceramic trophy. Like he falls off the stairs. Mm-hmm. Like and and it's just like man, this is super fucking gross. But at the same time, it's like that kind of weird CGI blood that doesn't look very good. 
So it's just kind of dumb. Whatever. You can skip the babysitter. The good news about it is it's only 87 minutes. It has its moments just because it's so outrageous that it has to have moments. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just because they throw so much stuff at the wall, something's got to stick. Uh, moving on. The Little Hours. That's the movie that's based on the Decameron. Right. The Decameron. I saw this at uh, Buff last D- year. You saw it? Yeah. It's no good. It, People like it. It almost was good. Um, I think then they lean on... Letting, for example, letting Fred Armis and like say non jokes in sarcastic, like yeah. ironic tones, yeah, and too many moments are diluted mm-hmm. by that. Yeah, a, a lot of this stuff works. It's it's about uh, these uh, nuns living at this convent who um, take in quite by accident because John C. Riley's a priest and he brings in this guy, Dave Franco, who's being chased by Nick Offerman, who's trying to kill him, Mm -hmm. having sex with his wife. And John C. Riley says, all right, you're deaf and you're a mute and you'll just work here at the convent where I am like the one priest there and everything will be fine. But the nuns, half of them hate him. Half of them are like, ooh, he's kind of hot. So half of them are trying to have sex with him. Half of them are trying to like figure out what's going on. Kate McCoochie's a nun and she realizes she's a lesbian during this whole thing. Um, it's, it's very, very contemporary, but at the same time it takes place in like the 14th century. Um, and, uh, there's, you know, the whole scene where Aubrey Plaza, you find out she's a witch and it's a scene like right out of the witch, Yeah. um, where they're like dancing around a fire naked and, you know, then Kate Micucci shows up naked and they're like, you're not part of the coven. She's like, oh, this, you guys are witches. That's crazy. That's part of her, her whole freak out mm-hmm. from that until she's running through the convent. That part was pretty funny. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Aubrey Plaza just using the word fuck in the 14th century, it, it's not so funny. Um, yeah, or like uh, what, Paul, what fucking mad about you? No, <laughs> Paul Reiser. Reiser. Paul Reiser shows up and like he's funny except when he's going, oh yeah, the business. Like yeah. when it turns into those kinds of just like Apatowian. Well, it kind of feels like, I always think of it this way. People love uh, The Princess Bride. Mm-hmm. And it has its moments, as many movies do. But I hate all of the Miracle Max stuff mm. because it's basically just Billy Crystal doing shtick for seven right. minutes. And it mm-hmm. just is, it has, it's completely out of whack with the tone of the rest of the movie, even though the tone of the rest of the movie is cheeky and sort of like haha, wink, wink. But this is like a different kind of haha. This is like Saturday Night Live that he's doing. Right. And the rest of it is just like, you know, sort of. Um, it's more like uh, a spinal tap right. kind of. Well, like uh, these scenes wouldn't appear in the book. Right. 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 So I, I kind of feel like the little hour suffers from an identity crisis like that. It's supposed to be kind of edgy and funny, but at the same time, it's based on this very old text that is, you know, studied in colleges for semesters at a time. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it sort of works, but it doesn't really work. And then it doesn't mm-hmm. really have an ending. It just kind of ends. Yeah. So, I don't know. It right, has some I mean, It was a uh, the Cameron, those were not stories with three acts. Right. They just it was it, they were anecdotes essentially. Right. And a bunch of them are strung together into a sort of coherent story. Yeah. Um but the other thing is is that it kind of falls into everything kind of falls everybody kind of plays to their type. Alison Brie kind of plays the innocent who becomes, you know, kind of empowered Uh, Aubrey Plaza plays the fucking angry bitch, you know, which is what she does. Kate Mm -hmm. McCucci plays the like the timid whatever, which Mm -hmm. is kind of what she does. Uh, John C. Riley plays like the secret drunk, which is what he's done a bunch of times. So it just kind of there's not really a lot of imagination to it. Mm -hmm. Um, Although the whole idea that the donkey is the donkey running away or is she trying to lose the donkey? Which one is it? That's kind of funny, I thought. But whatever. It looks good. It does look good. Um, They filmed it in real locations where this story would have happened. Yeah. That's a fun fact. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's that. I mean, you know, it's also short. It's less than an hour and a half. And then finally I watched because it's been free in prime for, I don't know how long. My name is nobody. And I just see Henry Fonda and it's a spaghetti Western. And I'm thinking, and it's like from Sergio Leone. And I'm like, okay, from Sergio Leone, but I've Mm -hmm. never heard of this movie. So I start watching it and the credits are in un the movies in English. But the the credits are in untranslated Italian. <laughs> so you're watching the credits and you're like, star it. And it's like, presente, blah, blah, blah. You know, Henry Fonda, Terrence, whatever the guy's name is, Hill. 
Um, who's Italian, by the way? <laughs> He's just one of those guys who used an English-sounding name, mm-hmm. although he does speak English, and he, he dubbed his own work. That's the other thing. Just like all the spaghetti westerns, everybody is speaking their own language and then dubbing it later because mm-hmm. a lot of times in Italian movies of the time, they didn't record dialogue while they were shooting, mm-hmm. which I'll never understand why that was. Yeah. I'm going to go with cost-effective. Cost-effective. That's true of a lot of Eastern Bloc movies, too. Yeah. So um, so the the words mostly match. Henry Fonda's words match up pretty well. By that time, he'd been doing ADR for who knows how long. But anyway, you're watching the credits, and then you get to the one where Sergio Leone's name is mentioned, and it says, and I know just enough, because it looks just French enough, Based on an idea by Sergio Leone. And I'm like, what? And then it's the screenplay is by like three different dudes. And it's directed by some Italian director that you've mm-hmm. never heard of before unless you've watched a bunch of other, you know, spaghetti yeah. westerns. I do, but Sergio Leone was drunk in a bar once and I was nearby and he said, oh, well, that would be kind of cool. Yeah. And he I scribbled think, in on a cocktail napkin. I think that's me. probably what happened. He's like, here is my one page of treatment. You write it, you give me spaghetti. You know, so um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So this movie, and it's kind of like watching Sergio Leone light because it's very light on plot, like all of his movies. Well, except for, I mean, Once Upon a Time in America has so much mm-hmm. plot that it's kind of, it, there's a reason that movie's three and a oh, half hours kill long. me. Oh, oh, I love it. I love that movie. If you've seen the whole long extended version uh-huh. <laughs> and not the, not the two hour and 10 minute version. No, that, I watched the long one. W- that doesn't make any sense, <laughs> but okay, fine. You don't love it. Um, this is kind of like if somebody decided to direct, um, I wouldn't say Yojimbo. It's more like, uh, not Yojimbo, uh, uh, Fistful. It's like, it's like for a few dollars more, Mm -hmm. except shorter and with even less going on. (laughs) (laughs) That's quite the description. Yeah. And then, but the thing is, is like Henry Fonda by this point in his career, he could phone in a good performance. He's Mm -hmm. so great in this part, but then it has this like. The whole idea is, you know, uh, the movie takes place in 1899. It's a Western, and he's trying. To, he's like the most famous lawman of all time, and he's trying to retire, but people are trying to kill him. And then this guy, Terrence Hill, is like, I've been studying it my whole life, old man, and what you got to do is kill 150 men and then disappear. And he's like, I'm not going to do that. He's like, you're going to do that. And the guy like keeps following him and kind of forces him into that situation (laughs) where he actually has to do that. And when that happened, I was, because you can see it coming a mile away, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, you're like, how is he going to kill all of these guys riding across the desert on horseback? Mm -hmm. And then what you remember, because you've been watching this movie and so little happens that you actually remember, wait a minute, somebody was handing these guys sticks of dynamite that they were putting in their saddlebags. And he saw them do that. So what does he do? He shoots the saddlebags and blows up like all of these guys. <laughs> and then Terrence Hill is there and he's got a shovel because he's stolen a train and he's using the shovel to shovel coal. And then he's marking, he's putting hash marks on the on the uh, shovel. And, you know, you see one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, and like he's counting and Henry Fonda looks over at him and he's, he'll shake his head. And then Henry Fonda will shoot a few more guys and they'll blow up. And then he'll mark a few on the shovel. And then finally he looks over at Henry Fonda and goes, okay. And then Henry <laughs> Fonda like jumps on the train and they ride off. And then he kills him in a fake duel so that everybody thinks he's dead. And then Henry Fonda writes him the longest closing VO letter in movie history where he's like, kid, this is how it used to be. And I understand why you're doing what you're doing. And you keep calling yourself nobody, but now you killed me. So you're somebody. So you better watch out. And that, 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 It's that. long enough to hear the... Yeah. Of the turning of the page. You really do. <laughs> yes. Because you see Henry Fonda writing it, and you're like, you know, this letter is longer than a page and, like, front and back, I, you know? <laughs> so uh, so that's it. I mean, it has its nice stylistic touches. It kind of does some stupid stuff. Like, the part of the joke is that the Terrence Hill character, nobody, is his, he, that's what he says his name is. His name is nobody. That he can pull his gun so fast that he can pull it and reholster it three times before you pull yours. And, of course, they show him doing that in the movie, but it's just because they speed up the camera work, so it looks really <laughs> stupid. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it looks like Benny Hill style. It really does. <laughs> it's like you expect to hear... <laughs> like the wacky sax going in the background. So those are the three movies I watched. I mean, you know, I, I watched three other movies, but those are for a film festival, and we'll get to those another time, but... Uh, that's the one I'm most inclined to watch. Yeah, it's worth seeing. Why not? You know, it's free on Prime right now, and it has been for a while. I think Prime must have rights to it because it hasn't gone away. <laughs> so, there. But um, let's move on to Keanu's on because yeah. I feel like this is something we can all get behind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, Dave and I were there. Uh, Evan, we were. Uh, you've seen most of these. Yeah, I've seen most of them. So I'll just I'll list the movies real quick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, now I'll also say that the crowd ahead of time only knew Point Break and Speed. That was the beginning and ending movies. Mm-hmm. Everything else in the middle was announced the moments before the movie began. Except that uh, you may not have known this. The Globe spoiled Johnny Mnemonic. Intentionally? The, in, well, I, it must yeah. have been because it was they interviewed, um, how do you pronounce his last name, Mark Anastasio? Uh, Anastasio. Anastasio. See, because there's the screenwriter, Paul Anastasio, and I'm you know never sure which way you go. Anyway, um, they oh. interviewed him for the Globe, and the Globe mentioned that Johnny Mnemonic was going to be on oh. the the sheet. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, my free Globe articles were up, ah. <laughs> so I didn't see that article. Um, but so Point Break, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, which Johnny, I knew they were going to do. Yeah, oh, yeah, I had a feeling. I had a feeling too. Johnny Mnemonic. I, I knew they were going to do that, which even I was hoping I read, for. Yeah, I was hoping for that even before I read that article. Uh, a Scanner Darkly didn't expect that one, um, and then Constantine, which. Uh, well, we'll get to it soon. Also, had had never seen it before. Um, I had never seen Johnny Mnemonic. I'd never seen Constantine. I actually, I think I'd so it, Johnny Mnemonic existed in that time when I was just asleep. I, I was half awake watching HBO and I saw moments. Yeah, but I never sat down and watched it. And this is the first time I ever watched it front to back. Mm-hmm. Um, and boy, is it a movie! It, it, it <laughs> sure is a, a feature-length motion picture with some dolphin, apparently, according to the sheet. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's go through from the beginning. We don't really need to talk about Point Break because that's no. been talked about to death. Yeah, we've even mm. dubbed it the ultimate will they, won't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. We talked about it on the show. Well, here's well, the one thing I hadn't watched in a long time. The one thing I noticed about it, and maybe this is just because I've seen it a million times, or maybe it's because I'm older. It's a lot slower than I remember it being. Mm. It mm-hmm. it still works, but it takes a long time to do what it does. Mm-hmm. So that's all I'll say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With with basically no wasted scenes, though. That's true. It's not like there's a lot of dead weight, but mm-hmm. it's just like it takes it for an action movie with great action scenes. Mm-hmm. It takes its time doing shit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, great opening movie. Great movie. First time I ever saw it on a screen with a crowd. Really? Yeah. See, I'm so old that I saw it on open weekend. <laughs> yeah, I so. was uh, I was not yet old enough to see an R-rated movie on my own. Um, <laughs> so it was called Point Break in French too, by the way. <laughs> the Point Break. <laughs> um, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, um, which I had not seen since 1991, and I'd seen it since then, but not for at least 10, 12, 13 years. I tried to get one of my ex girlfriends to watch it with me because she forced me to sit through Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the Peter Frampton movie. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, as revenge, I know that she'll hate Bill and Ted's bogus journey, but she hated it so much. She could only get through 15 minutes. So, <laughs> you know, we broke up shortly after. I see. I liked that movie when I saw, I remember seeing when I was a kid and I don't think it, it is possible that I saw it before Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I don't remember the actual order of me seeing them, but I definitely remember it being on one of the movie channels and watching it a bunch of times because mm. I thought it was really entertaining. One of the things that's great about Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey is, it, as a movie, it's better than Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, for sure. Um, like as a story, as a whatever. As an experience, I, I think Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure might be better because well, it's, it's faster-paced... The gags are gaggier. Mm-hmm. Um, Bill and Ted's bogus journey, like, it's almost like it has things to say, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it also, part of the reason I think it's a better movie, and that's in air quotes, is because it knows film history in a way that Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure ignores film history. Because there's all the German expressionist stuff going on in hell, and there's all the Ingmar Bergman stuff with death, mm-hmm. and you know th- there's all of those things, and then there's the weird animatronic kind of stuff that's in there that's very avant-garde. Mm-hmm. Um, but is it as fun as Bill and Ted's no. Excellent Adventure? It's not as fun. It's not as funny. Um, I I kind of. I, I liked it when they fell forever. That was fun. Yeah, there's some, there are funny moments, but I feel like it's a little too mean spirited. It's a little mean spirited, and yeah. I that's it's just after such a joyful, pure, just fun ride of excellent adventure, where I don't think there's a single joke in there that's not either funny or justifiable in the first one. And this one, it I don't know. I I I did. I was not interested or 
uh, like I was not in suspense. Nothing about what the what the evil robot Bill and Ted. Nothing they did was fun, funny, suspenseful, interesting. Anything at all for me? Hmm. Not at all. That that's interesting to me. I liked the death stuff. Everybody likes the death stuff. I yeah. think he's the best character in the movie. I think those are the, mm-hmm. like is when they're when they're playing the games, and then also anytime he comes back, like you know near the end, yeah. when he when he puts on the 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 with a frock or not a frock, right? But like some someone they're sneaking into it's, heaven. It's it's a dress basically. Yeah, but um, he puts it on over his robes, which is even funnier. But the other station doesn't work. Fucking sucks. Yeah, it everything about station. It makes no sense. It's not funny. Um, it's ugly. You know, uh, to look at, it's just kind of like, why, why is this here? Why couldn't the scientist just be, you know, Ben Franklin, mm-hmm. you know, um, uh, it comes out of nowhere. It doesn't really, yeah, it doesn't fit. Uh, it's not, it's again, not fun, funny, interesting. It's, it's none of those things. Yeah. It's just, I don't Bill know. being afraid of his grandmother is kind of funny. Yeah, sure. Oh, the hell stuff is great. <laughs> um, hell afterlife. Honestly, I think they should have kept it to that and not brought in station. Ah, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. If 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 it there's okay, there's a difference. Is excellent adventure is focused. Mm-hmm. It's about the thing it's about. What's bogus journey about? Well, they gotta win the you know the contest. Sure, but what's it about? Hosted by <laughs> Pam <know>? Greer. <laughs> like the excellent adventure is an adventure through time. That's basically it. Right. Um, everything else is in service to that. Well, this is sort of an adventure through hell, but not really. Yeah, there exactly. are other. There's a little too much plot in Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, where Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure is just like they've got to go through time so they can pass their history report. Mm-hmm. It's one sentence. Yeah, you know. Whereas this is just like okay, so they die and then they got to do this and then the robot guys do this and there's all that. You can't say it's like it's about Bill and Ted and they die and they have to come back to life and win a contest. That's just not enough. It's like Highlander two. <laughs> to Highlander, <laughs> Highlander is about immortals. Except Highlander two is. Horrible, but but it's the same thing. Explain Highlander two versus explain Highlander. Highlander is about immortals, and then there's a contest they got to win. Immortals you, you... keeping their heads attached to their bodies. Highlander two. Well, okay, there's kind of <laughs> another planet, but also maybe it's another dimension. And there's 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 the ozone layer, and there's yeah. da 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 da. Somebody told me that Highlander three acts like Highlander two didn't happen. Yeah, is that true? Uh, I, again, Highlander three is another half asleep. Oh, okay. <laughs> HBO. That's how I, that was a lot of my early film intake. But Bo- Bogus Journey does have some. I mean, a lot of it's fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's not enough George Carlin. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas in in Excellent Adventure, I don't think he's in the movie that much more. But it seems like he's used better. Mm-hmm. Um, although Jim Martin, his couple of moments in Bogus Journey are fun. And uh, well, so in the event page, they posted the picture that's clearly Bogus Journey, not Excellent Adventure. Yeah. Um, and then also there's uh, b- when you know we're waiting for the marathon to start. There's a soundtrack playing or like a playlist, uh, smaller and smaller by Faith No More came on, right? Which is from Angel Dust, which is the last album that Jim Martin's on. Yes. So I'm like, ah, I it's bet they're gonna play Journey. Bogus Journey. Yeah. I don't know if that was planned or I don't know if that's just Mark's playlist. I'm sure they planned that. Those those guys kind of yeah. know what they're doing. So, uh, but yes, I I hadn't seen. Bogus Journey since 1991, but I remembered Faith No More had a song on the soundtrack. So when I heard Smaller and Smaller, I'm like, it's Bogus Journey. Yeah. And then we were both right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so moving on, Johnny Mnemonic. Now, if there was an, ever a movie that was made in the 90s, <laughs> specifically the mid 90s, uh-huh. it was Johnny Mnemonic. Because this is that time when all the science fiction writers were theorizing about what the internet would be. Yeah, VR, the internet. Y- yes, there is VR in this. Uh, mostly it's, it's internet, uh, but it is VR because there's the whole mm-hmm. sequence where they're putting on like the, 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 the scanner helmet things mm-hmm. and they're like tapping air. But mm-hmm. you know, it's like disclosure when you're like looking at the, the disclosure movie with Michael Douglas where you're like inside the computer and you're picking out files, but it looks like you're just picking out air. <laughs> um, so there's an opening crawl. Which is really long, really long. It's like Star Wars long. <laughs> and then there's it. There's straight out of Hackers that kind of scene. And it's a. It, it, this is actually what it says: Internet 2021. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The one thing that bothered me about the there the only one thing bothered about me about the audience the entire night, and it was every time there was some sort of internet thing that came up in this movie that was clearly outdated or just a guess. Every, it was the funniest fucking thing they'd ever heard. And it's kind of like, all right, you saw the first thing happen. You knew what it was going to be. Can we just mm-hmm. let it go at that and watch this movie, please? Yeah. So the idea is that there are people who 
uh, like there are people who smuggle information through implants in their brain, uh, right? Yep. And Keanu Reeves is one of those. And he's had to give up long, like long-term mm-hmm. memory, and in this case, his childhood, right. to have enough storage mm-hmm. capacity. Mm-hmm. And his storage capacity is 160 gigs. Which is hilarious to everybody in this audience, but he needs to carry something that's 320, double his capacity, Mm -hmm. which on its face, I suppose the idea, which is what happens in the movie, that he uploads everything and it starts like leaking into his brain. I suppose that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you've ever had a computer before, when you hit the wall, you hit the wall. Right. Information (laughs) doesn't leak out of your computer. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And if you had to delete something, you're just... Technically, you're just overwriting data. You're not actually creating new data. Right. Right. So the idea is fear of the singularity and information overload. It taps into that fear. It doesn't make a lot of sense getting there. And also, the movie itself is so distracted by everything else it's got going on. Yeah. Well, it's also, it's really clumsy. Like, it, there's a lot of action in this movie, but it's really... It's not staged well. It's not directed particularly well. Like three of the action scenes happen in almost exactly the same place. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. And then they're under the th- this bridge in uh, Newark, which I don't know which bridge this could be, but okay. Uh, and like the same piece of the bridge keeps falling into the river <laughs> over and over. <laughs> Ice-T- is that Ice T's bridge? That's Ice T's bridge. Yeah. Yeah. This and, movie has Ice T and Henry Rollins. And yeah. Dolph and, Lundgren apparently. Dolph Lundgren is great. Oh, yeah. Dolph Lundgren is committed to this part in a way that he hasn't been committed since he played Ivan Drago. No, he's he's actually good. Is the thing? Yeah, like he's the only, he's the only person like acting acting. Yeah, there's a lot of people being like big face. I think Dina Meyer is acting. Oh yeah, sure. You know. Um. Yeah, I agree. And Keanu, Keanu's acting because this is even when Keanu's like winking at the camera, he's acting. This is the mm-hmm. thing that people I think don't appreciate about him is he is a He's committed oh, to yeah. everything he does. He's committed. I just mean that Dolph Lundgren is doing like character work. Yes, you that's know, true. That that sort of approach. Yes, uh, Keanu is definitely giving a lead performance, mm-hmm. um, not winking at the camera at all. Whereas uh, Dolph Lundgren is just, just like, I'm gonna have fun with this, and I'm gonna be good doing it. Yeah, and it was easy. It was a reminder that this was a genre. Yeah, and also a reminder of what time period it was, because when else was Henry Rollins? Did he have parts in movies that were this big? Yeah, right. Except for like, the chase. Yeah. You know? Because this the was... The chase and heat. It was in the same like five-year period. Yeah, because this is like right after Liar was a big deal. Mm-hmm. So... Um, and he published that book. Yeah. And he was on MTV a lot. Get in the van. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, Johnny Mnemonic, it's terrible. It's just so terrible. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's kind of charming in a retro sort of way. Yeah. Removed from time as a as a, as a as a as as like a memory... What, what do they call it? The box uh yeah, a time capsule yeah <laughs> <laughs> memory box uh as one of those if you're interested in what this kind of film looked like at this point in time you, you there's no better example yeah like, hackers mm-hmm. is fun this is not fun but it's emblematic yeah right <laughs> yeah yeah it's not fun but it's emblematic mm. enjoy kids so um but yeah. i had a great time watching it yeah i did too but when it was over i'm like i'm glad that's <laughs> yeah. over so then there was a Scanner Darkly, which is the movie that I chose to mostly sleep through. And I'm glad I did because I, I don't know what the style of animation is called. It looks rotoscoping. like... Rotoscoping. It is it, rotoscoping. It is, it, it is yeah. rotoscoping? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they filmed and then... Because rotos- it looks like um, rotoscoping, but like times 10 mm-hmm. to me. Because you know most of the time when you're watching a movie that's rotoscoped, it's very clearly what it is. It's mm-hmm. like you can... Because it, it, the action all looks like 90% real. Whereas this movie is is that, but it's also so stylized, mm-hmm. the manner uh, of animation that I I didn't realize that it was. It, it reminded me of rotoscoping, but I didn't realize it was. Yeah, because there's this uh, there's this drug that involves dissociation, um, but then there's also this suit that people wear to completely anonymize themselves, and uh, there's flights of fancy, and there's you know uh, you see things from the point of view of somebody who's under the influence of drugs. So that that's that lends itself to that. That's why the style works. 
I kind of figured a scanner darkly might be one of the movies, and I think it, that it had, had it played earlier in the night, I might have been on board more. Mm-hmm. But I think they might have programmed this one to be if you're going to sleep through one, it's this one. Right. Well, Johnny Mnemonic is like the sugar rush, right? <laughs> and then <laughs> Scanner Darkly is the come down. Yeah. Because it, it actually it, yeah. people are detoxing. Johnny Mnemonic is cocaine, and Scanner Darkly is heroin. <laughs> so. Or heroin and then methadone. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so there was that. And then I was fully awake for Constantine, which every review I've ever read of this movie says, this movie is dog shit. Fuck this movie. And I got to tell you, man, it was a blast. Yeah. I fucking loved Constantine. I truly enjoyed it. Yeah. Now I get it. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't like all of the rules that it has. It doesn't tell you that they exist. Mm-hmm. It's just like it assumes you know. Mm-hmm. You know, it it assumes maybe that you read Hellblazer. I'm I'm not sure, the comic that it's based on. But mm-hmm. I think it's from the it's from the point of view of a guy who's so exhausted about this world that he doesn't care that you understand it. Yeah. So, it, but the movie should the movie be taking right. that position? <laughs> I mean, maybe. You know, but the way this is one of those things. I said this to Chris afterward. This is when a movie that. Keanu Reeves doesn't get the credit he deserves for being a good actor. You know, people just kind of accuse him of like, whoa. And like, they think about things early in his career, like Dangerous Liaisons, when he's clearly out of place, or Mm -hmm. Bram Stoker's Dracula, which, fun movie, he's fine in it. He's not the right person to be doing that accent, but he's not bad. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, this is a movie at which he excels. Mm -hmm. He knows the material inside and out. He knows what's expected of him, and he plays it like a... He takes it seriously, but not like... He doesn't take himself seriously doing it. He's like, I'm going to nail the beats correctly in this, and it's going to be a blast. And it is. Mm -hmm. He's so good in this part. He nails all the jokes. He nails the serious stuff. Mm -hmm. He nails the, oh, I got to fucking deal with Rachel Weisz stuff, you know? And then it's like, ooh, hey, maybe we're kind of in love. I don't know. And the cool thing about it is, even though that she really gets on his nerves... There's never any just like, oh, bitch, get out of my... There's none of that. It's very... It's like um, it's like he respects her point of view as a... As a th- it's not... You know what I mean? It's not like they, they treat her just like, mm-hmm. oh, she's a throwaway character. Or, oh, mm-hmm. don't treat her with respect because she's not in on the, the joke like he is. No, he just has no patience for has taking no patience on for anyone else's issues at all. Right. That's, that's what it is. Yeah. And then... Um, and it turns out, of course... Have you seen Constantine? I've only seen bits and pieces of it, and I, I think I've mostly seen the parts toward the end of the movie. Well, well the gist is that he uh, is—he's a seer, I guess you would say. He—he mm-hmm. he can he can see demons, mm-hmm. and he can see angels for that matter. Um, and when he was younger, his parents thought he was insane, and they put him in an institution, and he got electroshock treatment and all that stuff, and he tried to kill himself, and he was dead on the table for two minutes. So his soul is damned, but he was brought back to life by EMTs or whatever. So he's still alive, and then he realized, you know, once he turned 18, he was like, fuck it, I'm going to do this because this is what I know how to do. Mm-hmm. And um, But because he's damned, he's trying to do all these works to get into heaven, but, you know, every time he sees Gabriel, who, of course, is <laughs> Tilda Swinton, um, Gabriel's like, man, you killed yourself. That's just how it goes. And then Rachel Weisz uh, is a cop, and her she has a twin who jumps off a building um, who believed the twin could see things like Keanu and she mm-hmm. believed in heaven and hell. So she's like, my sister wouldn't have killed herself because she would have known that it was eternal damnation. But she killed herself as a warning to Keanu to keep all of this stuff from happening. But Gavin Rossdale was planning for all this to happen because he's a demon. See, this is the thing. He's a half-breed is what mm-hmm. Keanu Reeves calls him, but he never explains how the half-breeds get up there. Yeah. It's like, how, are the, how do the half-breeds come into the realm? You know? Yeah, okay. You have a point about not explaining um, but it's still fun. I, you know, but I didn't question it during the movie. Neither did I. Huh. During the movie, I was just watching it happen. Like the whole thing where Pruitt Taylor Vince, who plays a priest who's an alcoholic who's trying not to drink, um, when he's doing that whole thing when he's breaking open all of those bottles of vodka or whatever it is in the liquor store and nothing's coming out of them but they're full, mm-hmm. it's just like, wait a minute. I'll bet he's actually drinking all that stuff. Yeah, and he drowns and himself. And he drowns himself and literally drowns himself mm-hmm. in alcohol, but he doesn't know he's doing it because Gavin mm-hmm. Rossdale has, you know, mm-hmm. convinced him that he's mm-hmm. not actually drinking. Um, but by that point, I was like totally invested. And I was mm-hmm. like, I bet that's what gonna is what's going to happen. And that's what happens. And I was like, yes, I understand what's going on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a legit good movie. And, and Dave, you said what I was thinking, but you said it 
in a, in a succinct way, which was that he's not even, hey, Keanu, we love you and you belong on a screen. You're a great movie star. It was like you, you gave us a great performance. It's a great a performance. A truly great performance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would watch it again. Oh, I totally am going to watch it again. If there were justice, he would have been nominated for awards for this mm-hmm. movie. But because it was a box office bomb and because it's a genre nobody takes seriously, mm-hmm. that's not going to happen. And I think it was pretty soon after The Matrix um, and maybe... It was, after the, it was right after the sequels, yeah. Right. Maybe there was some... Uh, like that was the lens through, that people saw it through. Yeah. I don't know. I wasn't reviewing movies at the time, so I can't really say what was on people's minds. But just watching it, on its own, 100% recommend. Shia LaBeef before he was annoying. Mm. So or They could have cut him out of the movie entirely. They could have. Actually, he was kind of annoying. Yeah. Well, yes and no. I mean, Not his was, fault annoying? He, he wasn't annoying the way he's annoying in the fucking robot movie. iRobot, you know? yeah. No, not... <laughs> <laughs> Transformers? Transformers. Is he an iRobot? He is an iRobot, oh. yeah. He, he is? plays like the kid who is like trying to talk to Will Smith in that movie. He's like, hey, trying to chat him up. That's who the fuck. That's who he is in this movie, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Oh, yeah. Right. I forgot. Yeah. Um, and then Speed, which Speed. we don't need to talk about, except to say that it's every bit as good as you remember. It mm-hmm. is a deathless classic. Man, it works. If If the here's my take. The action movie pinnacle of this era, sort of. And I'm going to lump this in. Mm hmm as the same era is Die Hard. Die Hard, five star movie scale, Die Hard's five stars. This is four and a half. Mm-hmm. This is Die Hard on a bus. It's Die Hard on a bus. Mm-hmm. And even if there were no Die Hard, it would be the best. If there were no Die Hard, it'd be the best action movie of that era. Mm-hmm. But there is a Die Hard. And I can't even remember right now what I'm thinking about that doesn't really work as well. I can't. But there's something about it that I'm like, it doesn't quite work as well as Die Hard because of this thing. And now I can't remember <laughs> what it is. So, But yeah, it loses nothing. And I'm glad I got to see it again yeah. on the big screen. And you remember like why this is why Sandra Bullock became a movie star. She was fucking great. And Instant. Dennis Hopper was great. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Jeff Dennis Daniels is great. Jeff Daniels. Fucking yes, everybody. Joe Morton as like their boss. Yeah. Oh, here's what it is. This is the thing. So Die Hard, everything makes sense. That everything has a reason. In this, they don't check the service elevator in the opening scene. Oh, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. sure. But I love the moment there where there's the gap in the freeway and Joe Morton, the best part of the movie is just like, oh, you're fired. Everybody's fucking fired. Yeah. I love that. What's really great about Speed is it starts and there is no let up. It's like, Mm -hmm. it's almost like they should have called it, you know, like fucking you know, take a tranquilizer because there's going to be so much adrenaline cor- you know, coursing through your body. So the best movie to end the marathon with. <laughs> yeah. But like that scene where they're like going around that big, that hard right. And she's like, we're going to tip over. And he's like, we're not going to tip over. And then Keanu says, yeah, you're right. We're going to get tip over everybody on this side of the bus. It's yeah. just like, you feel that yeah. you feel like this is going to tip over. You said yeah. Point Break moved slower than you remember. Yeah. This moved even faster than I remember. I do too. And you know what I noticed? It was a great moment that I've never noticed before. He goes to the coffee shop before the first bus explodes. Mm-hmm. And when he's getting in his car, he puts his coffee on top of the car. Mm-hmm. And then the bus explodes and he goes and he chases it. And then he's like, got to go wherever. He gets back in his car and the coffee is still on his car. The continuity is so good <laughs> that his coffee cup is on the hood of uh, the roof of his car and he forgets about it. Mm-hmm. And then it falls off when he's driving away. Fucking Beautiful. awesome. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Keanuthon. Keanuthon. Spider-Man. Far from home. Oh, so, yeah. So before we get into this, uh, I'm just going to say really quickly, don't be like the guy who we got kicked out from every movie screening forever and stand up and scream, I called it. I called it. I fucking called it. Uh, don't do that. Uh, and then don't threaten me with physical violence afterward. Yeah. Because I will rat you out. And you will be removed forever. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. <laughs> uh, be a fan. I like these movies too. Yeah. Uh, don't be the guy that yells in recognition so demonstrative, demonstratively. Yeah. I so get- hey, everybody, check out how many forums I've read. Right. Watch the movie and then talk about the movie all you want. But like, we all got to watch it too. We also want to hear what happens. Right. Oh, and I guess what I mean is, if you're gonna be the kind of person who enjoys it, don't do it from the press row. Yeah. Because right. like, I've got to write about this. <laughs> And I need to know what's going on. If you want to go back to like the third row from the back, and this is an IMAX movie, so you can see everything just fine. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Have fun. But don't do it when you're sitting directly behind me. You know? It's just like we all have a job to do. There are other people in our group, 
in our industry. Some of them are friends. Some of them are acquaintances who write for the kinds of things this guy writes for who just sit there and quietly watch movies because they know it's their job. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, yeah, anyway. So don't be that guy. Anyway, Spider-Man Far From Home. What would you guys think? I liked it. Um, I think it was a little rough in the beginning for me. Uh, Some of the jokes just weren't really landing. It was just kind of a little bit shaky. But um, I don't know. Somewhere to the middle, I really started enjoying it. I, I don't know that I buy... The villain of the movie? <laughs> well, okay. Retcon question. Does he actually show up in Iron Man? Is Jake Gyllenhaal in Iron no. Man 3? So it is a retcon. No, no but a... some of those people are. Okay. Some of those well, people yeah, like, are. Like the guy who's in the first Iron Man movie getting yelled yeah, at by Jeff Bridges. It was It was a little retcon-y. But so... Is Peter Billingsley in any of the other mm-hmm. Iron Man movies? Why does he have to be in every John Favreau movie? Why? <laughs> I, I don't know. You know? I don't know. Because so, every time he's on screen, I'm like, Ralphie's all grown up. Yeah. You know? Uh, well, maybe we'll just start with the briefest of plot summaries. So, so Spider-Man uh, Far From Home, you know, the sequel to Spider-Man Homecoming takes place after um, the end of um, Endgame. Endgame. So everybody has blipped <laughs> back, so to speak. That's what they're calling it. They were blipped. Um, by and that rationale, Peter Parker should be five years older, too, by the way, but he's not. No, but he blipped away and then blipped back. Yeah, but the other kid blipped away and blipped back, but he's five years older. Which one? He would. He did not. He no, did, he didn't blip away. No, the not. one who was that five was, years. That was the it point. It was confusingly stated, but oh, he did not. Oh, okay. Blip away. I That's thought that he, he blipped away. <laughs> now, he did not. But no, this, some this, people aged five years, but the people who disappeared and came back. Didn't. Oh, so he was like in eighth grade, and yeah. they they blipped away. Right. They came back. He was now a senior, but they're still seniors. They mm-hmm. they haven't. Mm-hmm. Aged. Okay, right. I got it backwards. So for reasons, Spider Man and his classmates go on a trip to Europe. A science trip. Oh, so I guess Betty Brant blipped away too, and so did um, Ned and all those guys. Everybody who's now yeah. five years older, yeah. Yes, yeah. and for some reason, almost the whole school blipped away, <laughs> which doesn't make sense because if you think like if half the population vanished, then more of them should not have blipped, but that's okay. I don't, we don't need to sit here and worry about that part of the plot. Uh, so yeah, so Spider-Man goes to Europe, uh, but there's this, there's a, you know, a water demon thing. Yeah, he he gets to Venice, and there's this crazy water thing that comes up, and Jake Gyllenhaal shows up as Mysterio and fights it, and they fight it together, and now all of a sudden Mysterio is, you know, part of some like one person team working with you know uh, Nick Fury and, and Maria Hill. Is that her name? Maria mm-hmm. Hill. Yeah. Who, and, is this the movie that she's in the most? Possibly. I, I mean, mean, she was in the first. The first Avengers. Avengers was a lot. Yeah, she I'm, was in a lot. I mean, I, I like Kobe Smulders as much as the next guy, but does she really do anything? I don't know. Her uh, character. I mean, her character. No, I mean. yeah, no, I know what you mean. So yeah, it, it's this whole thing of like you know Jake Gyllenhaal is Mysterio, and he has this crazy backstory, which is uh, unbelievable that he's from an alternate universe and. Anyone who knows Spider-Man knows that Mysterio is a villain. So, like, why would he be in this universe as a hero? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and he's, you know, he's got a nice sensitive beard and he's got such a, you know, fatherly tone. Right. And, he, you know, he's clearly Spider-Man's feeling the absence of Tony Stark. Yeah. They say his name about a billion times in this so movie. They us, say Tony Stark more than they say Peter Parker. Right. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> us watching this movie... As an, as an audience member, you're thinking it's like, ah, they're going to turn the tables, even if you don't know that Mysterio's a villain. See, now, I didn't. And I, at the same time, was kind of like, why is this random dude showing up and then buying Peter Parker a drink mm-hmm. in a bar? That's weird. I mean, and the idea, so in the movie, is because this guy knows everybody's, he knows how to manipulate each key player. He knows, like, that's the idea, is that he mm-hmm. comes up with this interdimensional story right after Thanos. So, like, Earth is doing a lot of catching up with what is actually out in the world right now. And here's a guy from another dimension and can seemingly do all these things that most people on earth can't do. Mm -hmm. And so they buy into it. It fuels even Nick Fury. Uh, And then Spider-Man or Peter Parker is so ready for a new father figure. Mm -hmm. And in this guy comes, who's just like, you know, it's okay to want a normal life kid. And he's like a superhero role model. And he's a personal role model. Mm -hmm. So that's how he insinuates himself so quickly. Um, As I'm watching the movie, you're like, you're a villain. When are when are you going to be a villain? And I'm okay with that. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. okay with it's it. It's just the moment of the reveal just feels so ridiculous to get to Dave's retcon point, uh, because it's like 
the the cliche like you think of that scene in whatever Austin Powers when all the bad guys are standing in the room laughing maniacally. I mean, you get this scene in the movie where Jake Gyllenhaal reveals that he tricked Peter Parker into giving him, you know, uh, what Edith. Was it? Edith, which is this crazy defensism that Tony Stark made. He's handed and over gifted control. to Peter. Yeah, he's handed over control to Jake Gyllenhaal, and he's like, "Ha Now I got it!" And we're all these people who used to work for Tony Stark and see us in flashbacks and random moments where we were betrayed by Tony Stark, and now we get our revenge intellectually and financially. <laughs> yeah, I think that it knew it was doing that, but yeah. at the same time, it doesn't come across very well. No, it just it feels ridiculous, and like maybe even done with a bit of winking, but it just it feels so odd. And it just totally took me out of the mm. story. I, I gotta say, I I didn't appreciate the MJ uh, in the way that I did in the first one. It's like uh, she was just kind of like the girlfriend in this one, even though she's not just the girlfriend. But at the same time, it's like Zendaya's MJ in the first movie was like so fresh and funny and haha, and like she's she's every bit as smart as these guys, probably smarter. And this one, she's kind of like she figures out who Spider Man is, but she's also kind of playing catch up, and it kind of pissed me off. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It seemed like she was just sort of just like waiting for shit to happen to react to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? No, I do. I like her in the role, but I agree that the role was not as right. much fun. Right. Not as rich in the first one. Well, I think it's it, this movie would be hard to be as much fun as the first one just because, you know, you're dealing with I blipped away and my father figure's dead and all of this other stuff. Like a lot mm-hmm. of the jokes don't a lot of the jokes in the first movie were shit that Peter was going through. In this it's like secondary characters that he's sort of reacting to, like the relationship between Happy and Aunt May, that's just that's a big gag throughout the entire movie. Mm-hmm. But Peter's just like, "What are you guys doing? Are you guys dating?" And they're like, "Uh, maybe we're seeing each other, kind of, sorta." And you're just, about, "Oh, he's an awkward kid, and this is weird for him." But mm-hmm. the jokes, you know, is that Marissa Tomei would never sleep with a guy who looks like John Favreau. So, and but also, who Peter. Happy is in this whole series? Yes, that and he comes. Yeah. I'm just saying that John Favreau in real life, it's not happening with Marissa Tomei. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, meanwhile, through this whole thing, uh, is Tony Stark has been dead. Has been dead, and now <laughs> he's trying to catch up with. And then you've got all the other Avengers who are gone. There's there's some disarray, mm-hmm. and he is very much pursuing Peter Parker. He's not even trying to convince him. He is manipulating him. Yeah, he's changing his class's itinerary. He's he's cornering him. He's oh, talking about Nick yeah. Fury. Nick Fury. Yeah, yeah. He, he desperately wants slash needs Peter Parker's help, uh, and so yeah, he literally does everything in his power, even though you know, uh, mm-hmm. like Peter, some kind of mean spirited shit. Yeah, that is sort of funny, but at the same time, it's like, dude, he's seventeen. Come on. Then yeah. come to find out, he's not actually Nick Fury. Right. He's he's, he's hired he's by Nick scroll. Fury, basically. Yeah, I thought I found this movie very entertaining when. Um, you know, it's revealed that Jake Gyllenhaal's the villain, and he starts using his um, holographic technology to fuck with Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Like when he's in that building, and he's like thinks he's running through a, a hallway in class, and then he like gets kicked and falls off the side of the building into a pit. Like I thought that looked really cool. I feel like all the action scenes leading up to that just looked like crap, and then they just like shot their wad on all the like hallucinatory parts that he was like cooking up. See now the hallucinatory parts hallucinatory parts didn't work for me and I'll tell you why because you have to make up all that stuff on the fly you have to anticipate what Spider-Man's going to do and then do that thing and I was just like nobody's that smart nobody can program that quickly yeah I mean I just take for granted that come up with a piece of technology in this universe it's already the most po- advanced possible version of itself nah. and so I I, I, I I grant the movies that I just thought it looked really awesome like yeah it, hey no it looked good it, it looked good, and it was also appropriately freaky and, you know, throwing him off his game. Like, mm-hmm. to the point where at the end where he's, 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 Jake Gyllenhaal is up on this, like, footbridge controlling these drones, which you figure out is the reason why he, he's able to look like he's fighting things, is, like, the drones pretend to be, like, the monsters that he's fighting. Um, and he's in this hallway where he's turned on, like, the, you know, the, the, holographic technology and spider-man has to use his spider sense mm-hmm. to break his peter through. tingle <laughs> yeah <laughs> which sounds really dumb when they show it in the commercials but it actually is pretty fun- funny in the yeah. movie well they develop it in the in the movie because right. it's ame who who you know the supportive parent figure who's like 
who supports you but doesn't quite get the nuances. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. You're Peter Tingle. Yeah. (laughs) John Favreau tells him he's got to turn on the Peter Tingle or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And Uh, and his suit. I like how they did the suit. Um, I feel like for a while we've been waiting to see if they're going to bust out the the, like squirrel suit version Mm -hmm. of Spider-Man with like the wings on it. And this works pretty well because he basically like skydives in Mm -hmm. to uh, save the day. Yeah. 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 And and the the side story with Ned and Betty Brant was really funny too. Mm-hmm. How mm-hmm. they become instant boyfriend girlfriend on the trip, but then break up by the end of the trip, but oh, yeah. are still best friends. <laughs> <laughs> that was just really funny. Yeah, that was cute. Um, yeah, uh, Jacob Batalon has been great in this role. Yeah, uh, the whole time as the supportive friend. Um, I, I I think it's it, it, it had me laughing, it had me guessing. Um, and, and part of the reason that I, I kind of it was a breath of fresh air for me is like there were no aliens in it. We weren't fighting. I mean, until the very end, the post credit sequence. But it was just like a guy trying to do evil shit, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. I feel like we kind of needed that after fucking Avengers Endgame with like everybody like just blipping right. back and this. It just it was kind of it made it a more human sort of thing, which mm-hmm. is as corny as it sounds. Uh, I, I think that was necessary, and it and it worked. This is just kind of a human drama with some fucking fighting villains yeah, in it. I, I like i really liked the the central theme of him grappling with wanting a normal life as a teenager but still feeling like as a superhero he has certain shoes that he has to fill and can he live up to someone like iron man who was a father figure to him can he measure up to that yeah and a lot of it is him grappling with that idea of like can he or should he Maybe he's just should be his own person and like he'll do great things on his own and not have to feel like he has to be someone who he's not. Yeah, he only wants to be neighborhood Spider Man. He doesn't want to be Avenger Spider Man right. at this point. And I still like this I, I like this kid, Tom Holland, this English kid who's playing I guess he's actually not a kid, right? He's like twenty two. Mm-hmm. But um yeah. I think that he's, he's Spider Man. He's a really good Spider Man in a way that it in well, better than Andrew Garfield, obviously. Who wasn't? He gets a lot shit on a lot. He wasn't mm-hmm. bad. Those movies no, were bad. I mean, I, think, I liked he, him better than Tobey Maguire. He Spider-Man, captured a, he captured some of the elements of Peter Parker that the Toby that the Sam Raimi movies, as great as they are, uh, left out. Yeah, to make more room for other kinds of stuff in the movie. But mm-hmm. the Peter Parker, like, kind of sarcastic, like, doesn't take a lot of things seriously. Genius. Yeah. And who is out of his depth. Yeah. Yeah. This is like nerdy, but also kind of a jock at the same time. Right. It's like this weird fine line that the character has to like Mm. walk. And he feels, he feels like a kid. Whereas, which I know they made him younger in Mm Spider-Man Homecoming than I guess, because Peter's like a senior in the other movies or whatever. But it feels more like problems that a teenager would actually be dealing with rather than 29 year old Andrew Garfield playing an 18 year old. Right. You know? So anyway, yeah. things that made me laugh the most, um, like the Netherlands thing where everyone's just really nice. Yeah. <laughs> or they're in the jail. Right. Uh, yeah. Then he lets him, he lets himself out and then the guys like stay in the jail. So yeah. they, they close the door on themselves again. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, Oh, he has a baby. Uh, the, yeah. Um, what else? Night monkey. Yeah, that, that was, was really funny. funny. Yeah, that's not Spider Man in France. He's called Night Monkey. So it's a yeah. cheap European ripoff, and then he's <laughs> asking someone for help. It's like ah, Night Monkey. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and the relationship, the the Ned the and Betty. Ned and Betty relationship was really funny. Um, yeah. The teachers, JB Smoove, I think, was not as he. I, he's kind of off it, doing his own thing, but Martin Starr, I feel, is more appropriate to be the kind of goofy inept teacher yeah. yeah i agree with that i think i love jb smooth but i think he was a little just like put on camera do your thing yeah and his his actual the way he actually fit in although him saying it's like it hey it's witches yeah the whole that, time. that was funny he's like i'm saying this is a science teacher it's witchcraft <laughs> <laughs> that was funny yeah but uh yeah I mean, it's it's worth seeing. It's definitely you know a, a more minor movie, I guess, in the mm-hmm. in the canon. But it's it's a movie worth seeing. It's not like yeah. you know the Ed Norton movie that you can totally skip and not miss <laughs> a beat. You yeah, know? I'm more inclined to rewatch this one than any of the epics. Oh yeah, for sure. I would say so. I mean, it's shorter for one thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's about one thing the whole time, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, and then so I guess we should get to the part where the guy was yelling, "I called it," and this and that. Uh, the post it's basically it's a post credit scene or mid credit scene. I can't remember exactly which 
where Spider-Man is, uh, wh- you know, whipping around with the, with MJ and he drops her in Times Square. And then there's a video that comes on the, the screen and it's Jake Gyllenhaal before he, you know, was killed, uh, you know, it reveals. He says that Spider-Man was the one that planned all these attacks, not him. And then and that Spider-Man, Spider-Man is, is Peter gonna, Parker is Peter Parker. And that's uh what's his name j jonah jameson shows up by. but it's jk simmons playing him. yes so which is cool he was perfect for that character yeah. i feel like he was always meant to be that character so mm-hmm. to have him show up again yeah is a good tease knowing that that character always you know hated spider-man so which yeah is- a good reveal um I, I have no idea what he said neither unfortunately, do i because of this thing is behind yeah. us yeah i don't really remember either but it's i just figured it was more j jonah jameson just being angry and being like look at this people. spider-man's a menace spider-man's a menace yeah. let's get him <laughs> like he always does yeah i don't think it means anything cross universally i just no. think it means like we had this guy we're not going to try to recast it and also you guys kind of wanted this so here you go yeah although it, mm-hmm. it makes me kind of sad that that angry rice is going to end up working for him right but okay that's fine. You, you mm. wanna? You guys want to know something? Really, this is so dumb. It just took me forever to realize. So, Flash Thompson, who uh, is played by what's his name, Anthony Revolori, mm. he's very funny in, in the role of Flash Thompson. I like the direction they went in it. So he's always on his his streaming, talking to his people. Flash Mob it took me forever to realize that's because his name's fucking Flash Thompson. So of course <laughs> right. he calls his people <laughs> Flash Mob. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh. So I, dumb. I, I think we should. Took me so long. I think we that. should end with that little <laughs> confession there. If anybody, uh, d- unless you have anything else to add, either of you. No. Well, I, him. I do want to mention. Uh, this is a high school movie, so when it's people are high schoolers, that's also pretty funny. Like when he's live streaming from their wherever they are. They're some. They're somewhere in Venice, um, and uh, he's like, "Hey, everybody!" And just someone just comes and punches him in the dick. Like, <laughs> that's, it's like, oh yeah, you're in high school. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Spider-Man Far From Home Mm -hmm. and that does it for another episode of Spoiler Peace Theater Mm -hmm. we want to say thank you everybody for joining us we had a lot of fun this week so many movies that we went through but we hope it was worth it because it was worth it for us Mm -hmm. we had a good time and uh, so we'll get to all the stuff like uh, you can can get the show anywhere anywhere you can get a podcast you can get this show Mm -hmm. so let's get to the part where you contact us we got a very nice email from our uh, friend uh, Daniel in France, so thank you very hi, much. Uh, hi, nice and to hear from you And say hello to your plants for us as yes, well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and also, uh, he emailed us, which is spoilerpiece at gmail.com, so you can do that. You can get with us in touch. Uh, you can get in touch with us on Twitter at spoilerpiece. We're on Instagram at spoilerpiece. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are uh, available to call and leave a voicemail. Yes. 86221Peace. And if you leave that voicemail, you, actually, you never know. Somebody might answer the phone. Wouldn't that be weird if you're going to call it and be like, you guys suck, and then Evan answers the phone and you can't do it because <laughs> you don't want to yell at Evan because he's a really nice guy in real life? <laughs> so just keep that in mind if you're going to call and hate on us. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you can do that. Yes. I mean, why not? And you can also, if you really like the show, you can uh, kick us a few bucks at our Patreon page. Uh, that's patreon.com slash spoiler piece. Send us some dough. You get some stuff. You get some polls. You get some audio that nobody else gets. Mm -hmm. And uh, the new poll will be up by the end of the week. And uh, we won't tell you what it is now Mm -hmm. because um, we're having a little bit of a debate about what it's going to be. But we're pretty sure we got it. But we can tell you that this week's exclusive audio is us talking about the Matthew McConaughey film Serenity. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, not not the other Serenity, the Joss Whedon Serenity, the Matthew McConaughey Serenity, (laughs) which is just... You should you should really pony up the five bucks just to hear us talk about it. <laughs> but anyway, or the six bucks to watch it, or both. Or the six bucks to watch it. Yeah, it'll be an eleven dollar experience for you all in because mm-hmm. you'll want to know what we're talking about. Anyway, uh, that's the Patreon, so you can check us out there. And as far as uh, the other stuff goes, my name is Dave Riedel. I write for Salt Lake City Weekly, Orlando Weekly, another paper that um, I can't remember the name of right now because <laughs> it's brand new. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter and Letterboxd as Dave Sees Movies. My name is Chris Jensen. I'm a contributing writer at Seville Weekly. I'm a member of BAFCA. You can find me on Twitter at Etsuburite and Letterboxd K Jensen. That's K J E N S O N. My name is Evan Crean. I'm editor over at The Independent. I am co chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association, and I am co author of your 80s movie guide to better living. And you can follow me on Twitter and on Letterboxd as Real Recon. And we will see you next week. Later. Bye.